We're now going to look at the two major types of nucleophilic substitution reactions. These two reactions are uh, categorized by their specific mechanism. The first one of these is called the bimolecular nucleophilic substitution reaction. I'll explain the term bimolecular a little bit later. It's often abbreviated SN2, which stands for substitution nucleophilic bimolecular, two molecules. And that's generally the name that we're going to use to refer to it, the SN2 reaction. We're going to start by looking at the mechanism. Now, this mechanism was studied um, almost 100 years ago. And there's a lot of evidence for this mechanism that we're going to discuss. But to start with, I'm just going to present to you the mechanism as we understand it. So here is our mechanism written with curved arrows. We have our substrate with the leaving group attached. We have the nucleophile. What we believe happens is the nucleophile takes whatever pair of electrons it's going to use to make a bond, and it pushes those pairs of electrons onto the carbon that is specifically attached to the leaving group. Now, that carbon can't have five bonds. So in order to make room for the new bond to the nucleophile, the leaving group bond is simultaneously pushed off of the carbon onto the leaving group. So it's two arrows, make a bond, and break a bond. This then, if we work this out, we would now have this pair of electrons attached as a bond to this carbon, and then the leaving group would have one extra pair of electrons, and it would be floating around in the reaction solution. And as I mentioned, very often, we're not even gonna bother writing the leaving group. It's gonna be considered a byproduct that in the course of actually executing the reaction, we would discard. There's another way of looking at this reaction. <clears throat> we'll talk more about this later. We can depict this reaction in a more three-dimensional sense. In a three-dimensional sense, what we believe happens is that the nucleophile uses its electron cloud for its lone pair, and it approaches the, re the substrate carbon from the back side. In other words, from the side opposite to where the leaving group is attached. So we have this leaving group bond. The new bond that's being formed would be 180 degrees away from it. Again, we draw an arrow pushing this way. And what we can imagine is that these electrons are pushing this way and they're repelling this electrons out. In this view, then, we can draw a sketch of the transition state. The transition state should look something like this. We would have the nucleophile forming a bond. It wouldn't be a fully formed bond. The nucleophile would be farther away from the carbon than it ultimately ends. At the same time, the leaving group would be stretching away from the carbon on the other side. So that bond would gradually be breaking. And so these would be sort of partial bonds, bonds in the process of either forming or breaking. The other thing that would happen here is, as we bring this pair of electrons in from the back side, it's going to push the other three bonds away from it because of VSEPR. So those bonds are going to begin to move toward the leaving group side. In a transition state, they will essentially be very close to planar. And then as the leaving group leaves and is no longer able to push the bonds away in that direction, they'll flip over, ending up pointing in the opposite direction from the leaving group. We call this inversion. So the nucleophile attacks the carbon that has the leaving group, the nucleophile bond forms, and the leaving group bonds break simultaneously. And so this is an example of what we call a synchronous reaction. A synchronous reaction is a reaction where bonds are formed and broken simultaneously. 
and we proceed directly from reactant to product in one elementary reaction, we have no intermediates. This then would be our proposed reaction energy profile for the SN2 reaction. We would start with our reactants, the substrate and the nucleophile. The nucleophile would begin to push in on this side. As it does that, the um, potential energy is going to first increase for two reasons. First of all, the leaving group bond will begin to break. And when we break bonds, the potential energy of a substance goes up. But of course, we're also forming a bond at the same time. So the potential energy caused by that bond formation should be causing it to go down. However, there is another problem. If we look at the transition state, we have a lot more electron repulsion and a lot more steric crowding. That electron repulsion is going to raise the potential energy of the transition state. And it's going to go up as long as the nucleophile is still pushing in, but the leaving group is still very close. At a certain point then, the nucleophile bond formation is going to become very strong, while the leaving group repulsion is going to get weaker and weaker as it goes farther and farther away. At that point then, the potential energy of the reactant complex would begin to go back down until we re really reach the final structure of the, re of the product where the nucleophile now just has a bond. We're back to being tetrahedral, which is our ideal VSEPR orientation, and the leaving group is completely taken away. So we can see that we have a positive activation energy and that the activation energy is essentially caused by excess VSEPR repulsion. Essentially, as we change our hybridization to something like this, and we have increased repulsion, the potential energy of the system goes up. And this is very typical in organic chemistry reactions as a cause of the excess energy of the transition state. When we go back down then, we can estimate the delta G for this reaction by looking at delta H. And the reason for that is that in most cases, we have two species at the beginning, we go through one species, and then we come back down to two species at the end. So the change in entropy is not very large. So we can ignore the T delta S term in delta G. It's not exactly correct, but it's close enough for okay. Now, once we have a good idea of our mechanism and our energy profile, we can begin to discuss other important aspects of reaction mechanism study. One of the first of these is the rate law. The rate law is something that we discuss in general chemistry. The important characteristic of the rate law is what we call the rate determining step. The rate determining step is the slowest step of the mechanism. It's the elementary reaction that has the highest energy transition state. And the significance of it is that it controls the overall rate of the reaction. The rate law then is experimentally determined and it relates the rate of the reaction to the concentration of the reactants. So the general form of the rate law is the rate is equal to some kind of scaling constant times the concentration of A to the power of its coefficient times the concentration of B to the power of its coefficient and so forth. Now, the interesting thing is that when we talk about the reactants in the rate law, generally what we want to discuss is the reactance in the specific elementary reaction that is the rate determining step. But in the SN2 reaction, we see that there is only one elementary reaction. So it's the specific reactance of the SN2 reaction which we are going to put into the rate law. 
looking at that then, because the SN2 has only one step, that must be the rate determining step. We said that in the SN2 reaction, both the substrate and the nucleophile are specifically reactants in that step. So we would get a rate law that looks like this. The rate of the SN2 is, again, the rate constant times the concentration of the substrate to the first power because the coefficient is one times the concentration of the nucleophile to the first power because the coefficient is one. So scientists who study kinetics then have uh, ways to describe the form of these rate laws. For example, they say that this is a bimolecular reaction because if we look at the rate law, there are two molecules that appear in the rate law expression right here. Bimolecular, so that's where the SN2 comes from. Another thing that's often discussed is the reaction order. The reaction order is the sum of the exponents on these concentrations. So in this case, we have an exponent of one added to an exponent of one, so that is an exponent of two, and it is called second order. So SN2 is a second order reaction. Another really important characteristic of the SN2 reaction is its stereochemistry. As mentioned before, in the SN2 reaction, the nucleophile approaches the substrate carbon from the direct opposite side of the leaving group to carbon bond. And there's approximately a 180 degree angle from the nucleophile to the leaving group bond. This is called backside attack. As the nucleophile pushes in, it repels the three other groups in addition to the leaving group. It pushes them up away from itself. In the transition state, they're pushed halfway between where they started and the leaving group side. And then as the leaving group leaves, it can't hold them back. So they flip over or invert to the other side. This is called inversion of configuration. Here's an example. If we were to use this substrate, which has a chirality center on the substrate reactive carbon, and we were to take 100% of this particular configuration, this particular enantiomer, and react it with a nucleophile like iodide minus, which if we look, it's got lone pairs, it's got a negative charge, it should be attracted here. What we would see is that the iodide would replace the chlorine leaving group, but it would come in on the opposite side, which means that these two groups, the leaving group and then the other hydrogen, for example here, would essentially become reversed. They would be exchanged. So we would get essentially 100% of this enantiomer, and we would see that chlorine and iodine are in the opposite relative configuration. In other words, if we were to look at the direction that we go from hydrogen to ethyl to methyl here, it would be the opposite, I'm sorry, it would, um, Bah, scratch that. As the nucleophile approaches, the three other groups are repelled, they're pushed to the opposite side of the carbon, and we call this inversion of configuration. Now, there are, are some other organic chemistry terms that we're going to be able to introduce here. The first one is this. The SN2 is a reaction, what we call a stereospecific reaction. In a stereospecific reaction, we have one specific stereoisomer of the reactant, and that will produce one specific stereoisomer of the product. The significance of this is that if we use a different stereoisomer of the reactant, we should get a different stereoisomer of the product. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. One stereoisomer of reactant produces one specific stereoisomer of the product, 
And if we change the stereoisomer of the reactant, a different specific stereoisomer would be produced. Now, there are a couple of misconceptions about inversion of configuration. These will mean more to you when you start trying to practice with this. But essentially, inversion does not necessarily mean that S converts to R. I will say that this happens probably the majority of the time. But really, the specific R and S configurations are determined by the, con by the priorities of the nucleophile and leaving group. And we can find or, uh, nucleophilic substitution reactions where those priorities change. The other thing is that inversion doesn't affect the other stereocenters or chirality centers in the substrate. Only the reacting carbon is inverted. So if we have other chirality centers, they will not be inverted. They will not change to the mirror image. Another consideration in the SN2 reaction is steric hindrance. The number of carbon groups on the substrate carbon, the specific carbon with the leaving group, will determine its reactivity in the SN2 reaction. Essentially, as the number of carbon groups increases and there are fewer hydrogens on that substrate carbon, that substrate carbon becomes more sterically hindered, becomes more crowded with large groups. What we find is that steric hindrance of the substrate carbon disfavors SN2. So, for example, if we have a methyl or a primary substrate carbon, that's relatively unhindered and SN2 would be favored. If we have a secondary substrate carbon, we will see that SN2 can work if the groups aren't too big and if the nucleophile has certain characteristics. However, a tertiary substrate carbon is too sterically hindered and SN2 will never occur. Other reactions will compete and occur in its place. So I cannot emphasize enough, SN2 does not occur on tertiary carbons. Now why is that? Well, as we understand it, the nucleophile has to come in and begin to make a bond to the electron cloud of this carbon from the back side. To do so, it has to fit between the electron and steric clouds of these uh, three other groups on these bonds. As we replace very small hydrogens with larger carbon groups, you can see that it becomes harder and harder for the nucleophile to fit in and reach the backside of that carbon. Until ultimately, when we have three large carbon groups sterically hindering the backside of that carbon, the nucleophile will just be completely blocked from reaching the carbon.